headlines. A video of what appears to be a searcher picking up the black box from Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 emerges. A vote is expected by the UN Security Council on a resolution that would condemn the shooting down of the plane. South Korea's defense ministry slams North Korea's claim that its missile launches were exercises of its legitimate sovereignty. And Korea's finance minister and the Bank of Korea governor hold their first meeting promising cooperative efforts while recognizing growing downside risks. Hello and welcome to the newscast. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Our top story, we continue our coverage on the aftermath of the downing of the flight MH17 MH and the battle for control at the crash site in eastern Ukraine. For more on this story, we're joined by Paul E. from the News Center. Paul, Russian President Vladimir Putin has promised the Netherlands that he will help retrieve the bodies and planes the black boxes from the Ukrainian rebels. Has there been any progress on that front? Yes, Dutch investigators have reportedly been allowed to begin inspecting the recovered bodies of the victims that were loaded onto trains in the region controlled by pro-Russian separatists, the very ones who were suspected of shooting down the plane last Thursday. Kiev has also agreed that Dutch authorities should lead the international probe into the air disaster, which has claimed the lives of all 298 on board, more than half of them from the Netherlands. Our Son jong in reports. A spokesperson for the Dutch government press service said the latest conversation between Prime Minister Mark Rutte and Russian President Vladimir Putin focused on practical matters, including the handing over of the black boxes that were seen being retrieved from the crash site. The spokesperson said Putin vowed his full cooperation in handling the case, as well as allowing unrestricted access to the site. Prime Minister of self-proclaimed Donetsk People's Republic Alexander Brodai said they were ready to hand the black box to the International Civil Aviation Organization. We are keeping the black box in Donetsk. We are waiting for international civil aviation representatives to arrive. The rebel leader also said the bodies of victims recovered from the crash site would remain in refrigerated containers at a train station in the town of Torres in the meantime. International monitors had reported that the human remains were headed to an unknown site, expressing concerns about their whereabouts. Western leaders are furious about the manhandling of corpses and are urging Putin to take serious actions in helping international rescuers bring the bodies home. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, who described the scenes of separatists removing bodies as grotesque, said during an interview with CNN that the U.S. knows with confidence that Ukraine did not have a weapon capable of downing a jet. He added that it was pretty clear a missile system had been transferred from Russia. Meanwhile, an urgent vote led by Australia is expected to take place from the UN Security Council on a resolution that would condemn the shooting down of the plane and demand those responsible be held accountable. Son Jung In, Arirang News. And turning now to the growing crisis in the Middle East, the UN Security Council has called for immediate ceasefire in the Gaza Strip as Israel presses on with its military offensive against Hamas militants. Paul, the Israeli military operation has now entered its 14th day, with the fighting taking a heavy toll on civilians. That's right. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said he is sorry for the civilian casualties, but stressed Israeli defense forces will continue with their ground assault until its citizens were secured. Emergency health services in Gaza said more than 160 Palestinians, mostly civilians, have been killed over the past two days, raising the death toll to over 500 as of early Monday. This as nearly 84,000 people have fled their homes, according to the U.N., due to the shelling by land, sea and air. On the Israeli side, 18 troops have been killed since last Thursday, with reports that the armed wing of the Islamist Hamas movement had kidnapped an Israeli soldier. The members of the Security Council expressed serious concern about the growing number of casualties. The members of the Security Council called for an immediate cessation of hostilities based on a return to the November 2012 ceasefire agreement. 
Earlier during his regional peace tour, U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon urged Israel to exercise maximum restraint, saying that too many innocent people are dying. Secretary of State John Kerry has also been dispatched to Cairo for talks with Egyptian officials who have been trying to mediate a truce to the ongoing crisis. I see. Now, moving now to the United States, where a Florida state court has ordered the country's second largest cigarette maker to pay nearly $24 billion in a landmark case for cancer victims. Fill us in on the details. The ruling hands down a major victory to widow Cynthia Robinson, who filed the lawsuit against R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company on the behalf of her late husband, Michael Johnson. He died of lung cancer in 1996 at the age of 36 after smoking for more than two decades. His wife argued that the tobacco giant was negligent in failing to warn of the addictive nature of smoking and other dangers. Lead attorney Willie Gary says the verdict would send a clear message to Big Tobacco. And it's not about the appeals, it's not about the money. We've made a difference already. I think less people are going to smoke. I think that the tobacco companies are going to get their act together. They're going to make safer cigarettes. We know they can. They'll just make a little bit less money, but we'll save a whole lot of lives. And that's what it's all about. And the, the verdict marks the largest wrongful death payout for a single plaintiff in Florida's history. R.J. Reynolds, which produces the Camel, Winston, and Cool brands, called the damages grossly excessive and said it would appeal. And uh, Forbes Media has sold a majority stake of the company to a Hong Kong-based group of uh, international investors. We're talking about one of the most iconic media empires in America. How much did it cost? The agreement announced this past weekend stated that the deal would hand over Forbes magazine and its media affiliates to integrated whale media investments for undisclosed sum. But an inside source, according to Bloomberg, says the transaction is valued at $475 million. If the sale goes through, Steve Forbes will remain as chairman and editor-in-chief, while the Forbes family will stay on as a minority shell hoarder. Steve Forbes said the sale of the company founded by his grandfather should be seen as an opportunity to strengthen the company. The deal is significant as Forbes Media has been under the family's ownership for nearly a century, becoming a pioneer in American business journalism. Conditions of the agreement also say that Forbes Media will stay an independent company with its headquarters firmly planted in New York City. Charity? All right. Uh, thank you so much for those uh, stories. Paul E. there at the News Center with international news coverage. For the latest in news that impacts Korea and the world, join Kang Chedi for a lively half hour that covers politics, business, international news, and much more. Live at 8 every weeknight on Arirang TV. In recent weeks, North Korea has teetered back and forth from provocation to concession and again to provocation. The latest includes a threat of retaliation against Seoul and Washington for condemning its recent missile test, which it claims are part of its legitimate sovereignty. South Korea, of course, says it's nonsense. Kim min tells us more. South Korea's defense ministry has slammed the North's claim that its missile launches are exercises of legitimate sovereignty. In a regular briefing Monday, Defense Ministry spokesman Kim min sucks that the firing of ballistic missiles without navigational warning is being discussed at the UN Security Council as an inhuman act and that the issue is subject to international condemnation. Earlier, North Korea's powerful National Defense Commission gave Seoul and Washington an ultimatum, saying their isolating policies towards Pyongyang would be met with retaliation. Citing its recent proposals to Seoul that the two sides refrain from slandering each other, the commission said that it had done everything possible to improve inter-Korean ties and that the time had come for a final decision. The North has also flip-flopped in regards to its participation at the upcoming Asian Games, which will be hosted by the South. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un on Sunday highlighted cross-border reconciliation through the sporting event. Saying the Asian Games will be an important opportunity for the two Koreas to improve ties and alleviate distrust, he added sports are sacred and should not be used as a political bargaining chip for rebellious powers.
Pyongyang state media added North Korea has decided to send a delegation of athletes to the Incheon Asian Games from September 19th to October 4th. The North's apparent flip-flopping is thought to be its way of pressuring the South to return to negotiations. But the South isn't wavering. If North Korea really wants to participate in the Asian Games and improve inter-Korean relations, it needs to show sincerity. The spokesman added that the North is distorting the truth by blaming Seoul for the breakdown in last week's talks. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. So, sending all these mixed signals to South Korea, is this a new tactic under leader Kim Jong-un? What should we make out of North Korea's latest behavior? Our Hwang sung yi posed these questions to Robert Carlin, a former U.S. State Department official dealing mostly with North Korea. Um, the North Koreans will never be one thing or the other. Uh, and here's the difference. Uh, up until the point at which negotiations actually start, you'll see both uh, streams going side by side. Once negotiations start, you'll see much less and in some cases none at all of these what we consider provocative actions. You've also been holding informal talks with North Korea. Do you see any changes in perhaps their willingness to engage? As far as you can judge, they really keep trying and trying to figure out what it would take to get a positive response from the United States. So I don't think there's been a shift. I, I, I think they're, they're just frustrated because they, can't, they think they can't get traction. We see China and South Korea getting close together, and on the other part, we see Japan and North Korea getting closer together. How do you assess that? And also uh, the Russians and the Americans right. not being on very good terms. Mm -hmm. It looks pretty dismal, the landscape, for putting this back together again in any way that it can be productive. Uh, so I suspect that people are going to have to think about uh, a new forum in order to um, overcome these really negative trends. So if Prime Minister Abe does visit North Korea, how will that affect the trilateral alliance between Washington, Seoul and Tokyo? If it were to happen tomorrow, let's say, I think it would be a shock. If it happens um, some point in the future after uh, different capitals are able to consult and uh, people get more comfortable, maybe it won't be quite as negative. Do you think it will harm the uh, trilateral cooperation at all? I think it will. I think there'll be an effort to pretend that it doesn't, but in truth I think it will. Uh, be something that people will have to work very hard at to, to fix. How likely is it for us to see Kim Jong-un meet with Xi Jinping or uh, Prime Minister Abe? I would bet that he would meet with Prime Minister Abe before he meets with Xi Jinping. It's just my sense that that's liable to happen first. And uh, moving on to other stories, uh, Japan has uh, dispatched an official from its uh, National Security Council to South Korea for the first time since the country officially dropped its ban on collective self-defense earlier this month. An official at uh, Seoul's foreign ministry said Monday that senior official Takehiro Fuka Funakoshi, that is, arrived in Seoul on Sunday. He will meet with officials at South Korea's foreign and defense ministries on Monday and Tuesday. Funakoshi is expected to give a detailed explanation of Tokyo's push for collective self-defense and seek Seoul's understanding on this issue. This comes just days after the two countries held nuclear talks and amid rumors of a possible ministerial-level meeting next month. Lawmakers opened a month-long extraordinary session this month uh, with one goal above all others, narrowing their differences and passing a bill aimed at determining what caused the April ferry disaster. Chi myung -gil reports. The ruling Senori Party and the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy agreed Monday to relaunch a task force 
whose sole responsibility will be ironing out a special bill aimed at determining the cause of April's ferry disaster. The legislation calls for the creation of a parliamentary inspection team and outlines measures to provide compensation for the families of the victims, some of whom have been on a hunger strike since last week, demanding that the bill be passed by this Thursday. For that to happen, the nation's two main political parties will first have to resolve their differences. The main opposition party wants a special judicial police officer appointed to the parliamentary inspection team to ensure the effectiveness of the investigation. The ruling party has raised concerns about the idea, saying it could disturb judicial order and the division of powers prescribed by Korea's constitution. Our party has made new proposals to the ruling party as it's been saying that appointing the judicial officer disturbs the judicial order, but regardless, a plenary session must open on the 24th. The proposals given by the main opposition party could affect Korea's judicial order. We must get consent from the people. This is not a matter to be decided by a few. The ruling party has instead proposed appointing a special prosecutor to conduct investigations at the request of the inspection team. The unified main opposition has accused the ruling party of trying to block passage of the special bill, while the ruling party is blaming the main opposition for playing politics with the issue heading into the July 30th by-elections, where 15 parliamentary seats will be decided. Kim young Arirang News. Korea's new finance minister sat down for talks with the chief of the country's central bank this morning, with both agreeing that there are growing downside risks stemming largely from April's ferry disaster. But the finance minister made it clear that any decision over the country's key interest rate falls solely on the central bank. Hwang Jie has the details. Cooperating to support the Korean economy, that's what the nation's top two economic policymakers agreed upon in their first meeting. Finance Minister Choi kyung hwan who took office last week, met with the Bank of Korea Governor Lee Ju-yeol on Monday. They both shared views that the pace of economic recovery at home is slowing amid downside risks stemming from sluggish domestic demand, largely due to the ferry disaster in April. The two also shared concerns over structural problems within the domestic economy, such as the imbalance between the nation's exports and domestic demand and the divide between corporate and household income. Based on that understanding, Che and Yi agreed that it's important to integrate fiscal and monetary policies to tide over the problems at hand. That, however, will be done under one precondition, respecting the unique role of the two different bodies. Finance Minister Che emphasized that a change in the nation's key interest rate is a decision that the central bank makes independently. The meeting comes amid growing speculation that the appointment of the finance minister, who's widely known to be pro-growth, may exert pressure on the central bank to cut the key rate. While the new finance minister has not directly addressed the need for a cut, his recent remarks point to easing monetary policy to spur growth. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. The leaders of Korea and Portugal held a summit talks in Seoul on this Monday where economic issues topped the agenda. The presidential office of Chawade says the two countries signed two MOUs calling for increased cooperation in renewable energy and tourism. President Pakane and Portuguese President Silva exchanged views on how to increase bilateral cooperation in trade, investment and information technology and also agreed to pursue joint ventures in Portuguese spending countries worldwide. Korea's 100 billion won club is growing. More than 450 venture firms posted sales of more than 100 billion Korean won, or roughly 98 to 97, that is, million U.S. dollars last year. That's more than 9 percent higher from the total number of companies in the list in 2012, something the Small and Medium Business Administration chalks up to advances in technology and rising exports. The newest entrant into the club includes mobile messaging service Kakao Talk. The combined sales of the 454 firms on the list came to $98.5 billion. That accounts for more than 7% of Korea's GDP. 
Smartwatches are rising as the new growth engine for the IT industry. Market research firm Display Search says global shipments of smartwatches for next year will come to nearly 32.6 million, of more than 260. Percent from this year, at an average of 34 percent growth annually, the figure is expected to more than double in seven years. Samsung Electronics introduced its first smartwatch, the Galaxy Gear, last year, and Google and LG Electronics quickly followed suit. Apple is expected to enter the market later this year. Here in Korea, we would normally be in knee deep in monsoon rain around now. And unfortunately, or fortunately, rain has been hard to come by so far this year. And as our Connie Kim reports, the so called dry monsoon is impacting the way Koreans are spending. The monsoon period here in Korea, which usually falls from late June to late July, is when the nation receives about 40 percent of its precipitation for the whole year. But weaker than normal atmospheric pressure from the North Pacific has made for dry conditions so far this summer, and it's had a direct effect on consumer spending. Rain boots and umbrellas are usually flying off the shelves by now, but not this year. It's a sign that consumers are adjusting to the abnormally dry weather conditions. Some 400 millimeters of rain fell on Seoul from July 1st to the 15th last year, while just 23 and a half millimeters has fallen this year. As such, fewer people are buying rain boots, umbrellas, and other rain-related products, including dehumidifiers, which have been affected the most among all electric items. Sales of leisure or folding tables have jumped the most among all summer products, followed by camping and barbecue gear. Our sales have been dominated more by people going on vacation this year. Camping tables and other related items have been quite popular. The retail industry has also had to adjust its marketing strategies. Compared to last year, we aren't featuring the humidifiers or clothing that usually sells well during the monsoon period. We've cut out our coverage of these items by about 20 to 30 percent. Instead, they're promoting more vacation-related products, which have enjoyed a sales boom two to three weeks earlier than normal. Industry insiders say some retail shops have already started focusing on their upcoming fall products as a monsoon season isn't forecast to be as severe as in years past. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Ever since the virus that causes AIDS was discovered in the early 1980s, a scientist around the world have been working on finding a cure. Three decades later, a team of Korean researchers believes they've taken one big step toward that ultimate goal. Shin Se-min has the details. Over 35 million people worldwide are currently infected with HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. There is no cure and there's no vaccine, although Korean researchers believe they may be on the right track toward developing one. A team from Seoul National University says they have discovered an enzyme called SAMHD that breaks up the RNA of the part of virus that contains the infection. They say it leaves open the possibility of completely blocking off the infection in the first place. The HIV gene is composed of RNA strands, and the SAMHD1 cellular enzyme takes direct aim at the gene and completely restrains the virus from developing. The team is optimistic that the SAMHD1 enzyme can be developed into an AIDS vaccine over time. Even if the virus mutates as it normally does, the newly discovered enzyme will identify the changes, thereby raising the possibility of creating a vaccine. That would take time, though, up to 10 years to be exact, as a research team is now just wrapping up their basic cell research. The new findings have been published in the medical journal Nature Medicine. Shin Se-min, Arirang News.
Hello and welcome. I'm Kim Bo Kyung with the latest weather update. It was a hot, sweltering hot summer day here in Korea, and daytime highs in Gangwon-do province soared to as high as 36.6 degrees. Now, this doesn't come as a surprise as a heat wave alert has been issued for Gangwon-do and both Gyeongsang-do provinces and Daegu, and the heat wave warning is also in effect for most parts of the country. And more unwelcome news as we are in for a tropical night. UV levels will soar to the very high range in the southern regions tomorrow, so children and elderly must refrain from doing outdoor activities and please, please try to drink sufficient amounts of water. Tomorrow, monsoonal front. Well, at the moment, uh, uh, we are seeing cloudy skies across the map. Now, tomorrow, monsoonal front will gradually move in over the central regions, leading to monsoon rain. Seoul and Gyeonggi-do provinces are looking at about 20 to 60 millimeters meters of precipitation and an umbrella will come in handy. On to Tuesday's readings, Seoul and Busan hit 29 while Daegu soars to a hot 35. Daejeon, Jeju and Mount Kumgang make it to the low 30s while Tokdo peaks at 28. That's all I have for you now, but I'll be back with more updates after 10. Thanks so much for that, Bo Gyeong, and that will do it for this edition of Arirang News. Thanks for watching.